Well, good morning. We wanted to thank everyone for, for coming here today to, to uh, be part of our webinar. Um, before we get started, I want to take the opportunity to introduce uh, two special guests that we have here. Um, if we, if, Katrina, if you'd be so kind to talk a little bit about yourself, uh, your expertise at the firm, and also the firm that you represent. Good morning, everyone. My name is Katrina Sosa. I'm a senior associate at Haber Law. Um, my practice areas include community associations, uh, real estate litigation and transactions, uh, business litigation and transactions as well. Thank you so much, Katrina. And uh, next up we have here, Jonathan Goldstein. Hi, thank you, Raphael. Uh, first, on behalf of Haber Law PA, Raphael, we thank you so much for participating with us thank you. Uh, and uh, inviting us and working with us to, on this webinar. Uh, I'm Jonathan Goldstein. I'm the uh, chair of our firm's Community Association Law Department. I'm a partner at Haber Law Board Certified in Condominium and Plan Development Law. Uh, so uh, we look forward to uh, going over a lot of these topics. There's a lot of new developments. So uh, mm -hmm. Raphael, uh, please introduce yourself uh, and uh, let's get started. Sure, thank you. Well, my name is Raphael Aquino. I'm the co-founder of Affinity Management Services. Uh, we are an association management company who focuses on Dade County, Broward County, and Palm Beach County. Uh, I want to thank uh, Haber Law uh, as well as my team for helping put uh, this uh, webinar together. And um, I guess I also wanted to advise the, the listeners that are on that you do have the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, there should be a little, little box. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in there. And if we have the opportunity, we'll make sure to answer any and all questions. Um, so I know the idea behind the webinar, Jonathan and Katrina, was really to go over the, the finances and, and things like that. However, I did want to touch up on, on a little bit about the, the emergency orders that we're dealing with with, you know, with each different county. Um, further, uh, obviously, it's not just uh, the, the state order, then we have the county orders, and then we have the particular city orders, right? Um, so maybe I'll start with you, Jonathan. Could you tell me a little bit about, um, with regards to the different, with the three counties, what are you guys doing as a firm to, to keep your boards abreast of what's going on, what are the right ways of opening the potential amenities, whether it be pools, whether it be gyms, um, you know, what approach is, is Haberlaw taking with regards to the amenities? Sure, thank you, Raphael. So uh, first of all, uh, we're keeping uh, up to date on all the up updated emergency orders from the governor uh, and from the counties. Um, we send periodic updates to our clients uh, in the form of bulletins regarding those updates. We talk to our clients directly day to day. They, they frequently ask questions regarding coronavirus issues and updates. We advise whether the orders permit uh, certain amenities to reopen, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, just to go through some of the updates, for example, right now, um, there's a lot of developments because yeah. Governor DeSantis has put the state of Florida into phase one Mm -hmm. of the plan to reopen the state of Florida. And recently, Miami-Dade County and Broward were included within that. And so um, that has lifted the stay-at-home isolation requirements, where previously you were required to stay at home unless you were doing essential activity or performing essential services. And that was where everything else started, uh, in addition to the you know, closure of amenities. And now, now people can move more freely. There are more exceptions to that. There's more businesses that can be open. Um, in addition to that general step-by-step -step, uh, towards reopening, you have the different counties that are issuing their own local orders regarding amenity closures that affect community associations. So for example, in Broward County and Palm Beach County, pools have been reopened. Uh, including mm -hmm. residential community condominium, you know, condominium pools, uh, as have gyms, um, subject to very strict reopening requirements, which we can discuss as the conversation, you know, continues. Um, in Miami-Dade County, in contrast, the county has not yet lifted prior orders closing uh, pool amenities and gym amenities. In fact, there was just recently a Dade County order that governed commercial reopenings and Correct. specifically excluded from opening pools and gyms. But we expect this to change at any moment. And there was actually a handbook issued by Miami-Dade um, for like this uh, new normal situation. Yeah. They call it the new normal handbook. Yeah. That was and a great so, name. <laughs> and mm -hmm. the new normal handbook contemplates 
pool openings for Miami-Dade County. So it's any day now, everything's gonna be, you know, these things are gonna be reopened. And, and the theme with this is they're gonna require CDC compliance and Broward and Palm Beach already do. And also they're gonna have attached handouts or guidance from the county that deals with it. And Kat, uh, why don't you speak a little bit more about this? Uh, what types mm -hmm. of restrictions and what are some of the implications? So what we've seen so far is Palm Beach and Broward County have already, again, as Jonathan mentioned, lifted the uh, restrictions on pool areas and gyms. Um, and they've actually been pretty detailed in what needs to be followed in order to proceed in that manner. Of course, everything has been with the caveat that if a community association doesn't feel comfortable or doesn't have the resources to properly open um, so that they are complying with these strict guidelines, they shouldn't be doing it. But a lot of it's all based on complying with the CDC guidelines. We always recommend um, that our community associations are constantly checking these CDC guidelines. There's a hotline that can be called if there's any questions on that. Um, you must adhere to you know the six feet social distancing. Um, so what you're seeing is that the guidelines will have that you know in a pool area, um, whatever pool furniture is out there must be you know. If your family, your group can be together, but then it must be six feet apart from the next person who is coming onto the pool area. Um, we are seeing that hot tubs, um, saunas, and steam rooms are going to be remain closed. Um, in terms of gyms, it's the same situation. You're going to have your six feet apart from all the machinery in the gym. Um, there needs to be adequate places for, um, you know, antibacterial stations. There's um, routine cleaning that must be done. Um, and the orders have done a good job of listing all of those guidelines so that there isn't, you know, any ambiguity as to what needs to be followed. And I think that Miami-Dade will follow suit with that as well. Yeah, excellent. So, you know, it's been interesting, at least for, from our perspective, uh, you know, most board members have been doing the right thing. And, you know, our approach from management has been, look, let, let's work with our partners, with mm -hmm. our attorneys. Um, to understand this, because as you guys have mentioned, or both of you have mentioned, you know, things are changing by the minute. I mean, there's something that just changed yesterday that we'll, we'll, we'll go mm -hmm. into it. Um, but the challenges that, that that I'm seeing, you know, we're reading in the paper about these very high-end buildings and the approach that they've taken, and, and it's been amazing. I mean, it's been amazing what they're doing. I, they have the resources. However, what I'm seeing is more with the, the normal association that is probably comprised 90% of Miami-Dade and Broward County. Um, they're having a challenge because they don't have the staff or if they have the staff, it's really difficult to repurpose that staff for the specifics that are within the certain orders, right? Um, so with that said, you know, what recommendations would you give the regular associations that just don't have, you know, the monetary flow or the funds to be able to open the pools at the moment? Is your recommendation to keep them closed? Because I know we've been kind of pushing that with our clients to just, you know, take a take it a little bit slower to open the process rather than what the county is doing. What, what's your, your take on that? I do agree that if you don't have the resources to, um, you know, be safely reopening your amenities, you shouldn't be doing that. That being said, I think a big consideration in that in just making that decision is the size of the association, the number of people who will be accessing these amenities, because if it is a smaller building, I mean, it, there's a higher risk of, you know, this COVID spreading again in a right. 200 unit building than a 50 unit building. So that's a consideration that maybe an uh, association with less resources can think about saying, well, maybe we can still do this in, uh, you know, without having to really expend that much money on it. But if there's any doubt that you don't have the resources to safely reopen these amenities, I do think it's better to be on the more cautious side and hold off on that. Okay. Yeah, and to, to to just elaborate on Kat's point, you know, the orders are, are some, most of the orders are very clear that you have to be able to comply. If an association doesn't think it can comply, and this goes to the general theme of the presentation mm -hmm. regarding finances, because yeah. this is a major financial issue, because the Correct. costs of compliance really are onerous uh, to have that enforcement, and, and, it's, and it can be impractical. And if the associations can't comply, they, they cannot reopen. They're not allowed to reopen, I right. think, under the emergency orders. But it speaks to a bigger tension, this issue of if the association can comply, it speaks to the tension of do members have the right for the association to reopen the pool, right? right. And, and so, for example, you know, it's interesting because 
it all it all starts with the general principle that the association members have a right to use the pool. That's Correct. that's the general rule. But right. then if if you're doing construction on the pool, it's closed. Right. right. So there's some sort of level of necessity where you can close the pool because of necessity. Does does coronavirus rise to that level? I would argue it's certainly arguable that Definitely. even if the order doesn't require closure, there's some necessity that a reasonable board can apply to close the pool. But putting even beyond that, you have these emergency powers in 718-1265. And you have these emergency powers that basically allow the association to curtail the use of common elements because of guidance from health officials and municipal authorities. And so is it, and so based on those powers, associations are having a, another source of authority to close the pool, for example, and the gym. And so there's some debate about, you know, well, do the emergency powers really apply? And that's yeah. like a, a separate conversation we can have in regard to the emergency, the, the order from the division of condominiums that was entered yesterday, which we could talk about that. And so, but assuming the emergency powers apply, boards will also rely on that to close the pools. Um, so even though members might say, well, we have a right to use the pool, there's certainly arguments in the association's favor to close the pool on an optional basis, even though maybe they can provide the kind of enforcement uh, and uh, sanitation and CDC compliance that, you know, would allow them to reopen. Sure. So, so I'm going to leave it here with you, Jonathan. I wanted to ask this because I know this has been coming up a lot, especially with, with our clients. Um, number one, with that emergency order. So yesterday they signed, uh, the DBPR signed the emergency order 2020-06, uh, right? And the order basically looks like they're going to be lifting the emergency powers um, on June 1st, right? And specifically, they said sections one through nine. So let's say the, the let's say a board took took the right steps, created some rules for the reopening of the pool, right? Um, and now come June first, will those rules still apply? And what specifically is that is going to be the impact of that order on June first? Okay, great. So this is a big topic. Uh, first of all, our our understanding is the statute gives emergency powers. Yeah. Okay. And so the associations, when they consult with us about this, there's a statute that they can follow in their reasonable judgment and say, well, we interpret this to apply to us. And the question with the statute is, it only applies where there's damage caused by the, the event that led to the state of emergency. And yeah. so as practitioners, we're like, damage could mean harm to individuals. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> I would hope so. but that's damage. <laughs> and not to mention that damage could result because of people being ill and et cetera. But we think it, it, there's a great argument that it would apply anyway. But what the division did was they said, well, we're going to say that that damage clause, it doesn't really apply because of coronavirus. And so there's no limitation on emergency powers for these emergency powers. And they listed you know, a range of powers in the statute that didn't include borrowing or the power to special assess without a member vote, right? Yeah. There was a power to special assess without a member vote or borrow without a member vote. Division said that's, that's going to be typical. You have to have damage. But for everything else, you don't need damage in order to use these powers. Um, let me just say this. I was always highly skeptical about the order from the beginning. Yeah. The, okay. the division as an as an agency only has certain limited powers. The agency can do certain things, adopt rules, you know, it can declare, make declaratory statements and do disciplinary proceedings, right? And do arbitration. The division can't interpret the statute and have that be binding on the courts. And so really the the order should be looked at within that narrow context that as far as the division is concerned, in its enforcement of its own narrow responsibilities, the division is going to ignore the term damage and going to see the emergency powers as applying. But after June 1st, within the narrow scope of what the division does, the division is going to look at that damage clause and may not say that the emergency powers apply. Who knows? 
So it's like really narrow, even though it seems dramatic, I read it very narrowly to only apply to what the division is doing within its jurisdiction. I don't see it as like cutting off emergency powers. Right. Or ending them. The association has them or doesn't have them. A court will decide that. The division doesn't decide that. All the division can do is within its narrow role, it can do internal things to say, we're going to ignore whether there's damage or not. And we're going to just assume emergency powers apply. So to answer your question in a kind of roundabout way, I see the division order very narrowly. Associations should consult with their legal counsel about the risks and rewards of using the emergency powers and what that entails. And there are other issues that aren't even contemplated by the division order. Like, for example, does the statute even apply to older condominium associations that do not have language in their declaration that uh, incorporates future mm -hmm. changes to the condominium act? Correct. Like, you know, that's the different issue altogether. The language, exactly. you know, the, because the emergency powers were only enacted, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you know? So, no, less. It was even less, maybe around 10 years ago. So, again, those are some of the issues with the order. I think its, it's impact is much narrower than what people might assume. Okay, and 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 so you would say then you would take the position there that if the rules that if they did pass particular rules for the reopening and, and if this order does come into play, well, it will on June first that those rules will still apply. Yes, and that's a, those rules are with legal counsel's guidance regarding an interpretation of their statutory authority. Mm -hmm. The division's order only applies to if the division wants to you know deal with a complaint. Right. Or if the division is going to issue some sort of declaratory about question about so it's just the division and the division while it oversees condominiums in certain respects it only has certain narrow roles that are defined by statute so i would not say oh no the emergency powers don't apply anymore because the division withdrew its order i always thought that there was an argument the emergency powers applied i still do and it's not dependent on whether the division, and in fact, there was a constitutional amendment to the state of Florida constitution a year or two ago that specifically tells courts, you can't rely on administrative interpretations of the statutes. You have to make your own decisions. So, yeah. it's, but, but to your other point, Raphael, we do recommend, and we agree with you 100%, that associations should consult with counsel address whether these powers apply and document the reasonable thought process mm -hmm. in using them and use rules you know with board meetings that are remote like this have remote board meetings to ratify these policies they're changing they're fluid but have remote meetings to to confirm these policies to adopt the resolution that can you know can be prepared with council's help it documents that, you know, we as a board consulted with our management team at Affinity, you know, and, and got recommendations as to this. We consulted with legal counsel. We think it's reasonable to interpret the emergency power statute as applying to our condominium using those powers. We also think there's a necessity to keep the pool closed because we don't think we the association can bear the financial burden of compliance. Mm -hmm. Documenting those things creates a paper trail that is defensible if you have a problem with a particular owner saying, hey, I have a right to use the pool. Yeah. Right? No, yeah, I mean, of course, we've even gotten the question of um, why do we have to continue paying our fees if the amenities, you know, are not open? You know, and it's, it's. I mean, listen, these associations are nonprofit organizations. I think a lot of people miss that point and they count on every penny that comes in. Most budgets anyway are very tight and very slim. Um, so just missing, you know, having a couple owners not pay is a major impact to the association. And if that did happen, less chance that the common areas are going to open because mm, of the right. same guidelines that are in place, right? So, so I guess to to kind of wrap up the the um, the common areas and amenities opening, either Cat or, or Jonathan, what's mm -hmm. your overall um, recommendation on on like maybe a, a three to five step process before opening any of these common areas? Um. Well, I do think it depends on the area you're in, the size of your building, absolutely. Yeah. And you do need to take a look at your budget and what resources you have to pay for, you know, whether it's additional employees, to, because you do need to have, you know, your pool area and your gym area monitored to make sure that people are complying with the CDC guidelines um, and are actually doing their social distancing and wearing whatever protective 
gear they need to wear. You also need to pay for that uh, PPE. You need to pay for having um, additional places where you have, you know, antibacterial stations. Yeah. You need to make sure that you're having people cleaning all the different areas. So making sure you have those resources, seeing if it's feasible. If it's a bigger building, I think erring on the side of caution because of the number of people who could potentially, right. you know, access the area, even at a reduced amount. You know, I one of our one of our clients is a bigger property and their biggest concern was even at, you know, 50% or 25% capacity, that's 250 people that could be potentially in the area. That's troubling. So yep. thinking that, um, and really, because it, it comes to the association will, you know, expose themselves to liability if they aren't able to reach these CDC guidelines and adhere to the emergency orders that are being entered by all the different counties. Um, and it goes to a, you know, a standard of care and you want to make sure that you're able to provide that standard of care. Jonathan, is there anything you want to add? Jonathan, yeah, Jonathan, I just would. Have touched on one thing that I'd like for you to touch on as you add sure. on to that is the liability because we, yeah. are, we are getting that question a lot. Of what are the potential liabilities that we can face as an association, as a board and, and so forth? Sure. And first I'll, I'll just, kind of put context to that question. It's hard to prove in any case that it will be hard to prove that the association caused right. illness. Correct. In Correct. any case. So let's put that aside. You know, it'll be hard to show that that that, that particular person got sick at the pool. Right? right? But let's put that aside. There's still a risk and you still want to have reasonable care. Okay. Um, reasonable care is documented the way I just described and you described, Raphael, with proper you know, documentation and, and formalities. But there's other things that can be done. And I think the critical step-by-step -step as to, to, to build upon what Kat suggested, I think management, once you decide to reopen, would have to work with the board and have like almost a checklist mm -hmm. and say, look, here's the requirements in Dade County's you know, handbook. Here's the requirements in Palm Beach County's you know, guidelines, attachment six or whatever. Correct. You know, we can do this. We can do that. We can do this. We can do that. Then we have to have a plan. We will do it this way, that way, this way, that way. We will enforce it this way, that way, this way, that way. And then once you have that, you document it. And so you say, okay, because we've gone through that step, we can reopen. We will. But now we're going to give notice to all the members and we're going to give a disclaimer. We're going to say, you're assuming the risk. We're going to put whatever open disclosures are required by the CDC right. about social distancing and what have you. So we're going to be very active to give disclosures and say, hey, the association doesn't warranty your safety. Please see the declaration section that says we're not an insurer of your health and welfare and you're assuming the risk. We're, we mm -hmm. can't be liable. Please know that you're assuming the risk using the pool. We opened it, but we reserve the right to close it at any time if people are not complying. I would definitely put people on notice that the association will close the amenity if a critical mass of people do not comply or if the association finds it impractical to enforce the requirements. Mm -hmm. um, and I would have that internal plan to say, look, if, we, if this happens, we're going to close it up again. You could require a release. You could do more complicated things. You could talk to counsel about that. I'm not saying it's enforceable or not. I'm not going into the details of that, but you could talk to counsel about, can we require somebody to sign something to go to the pool or to do it electronically? So no, there's no say social distancing. Uh, can you do some sort of system where you don't give access to the amenity to somebody who's violated a requirement in the past? There's all things you could do, but to protect from liability, you wanna put those things into place. And, and I would do a disclaimer, and maybe a release, depending. That depends. I, I would yeah. talk with counsel for the association about that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Excellent. Um, so let's talk a little bit now about about the finances and and the potential impacts, right? Um, I know for us overall, we've been keeping a, a really close eye on what's going on with the receivables for for our entire portfolio. Um, and, and we did see between February and March, it was normal. Um, uh, March to April, we saw about a one and a half percent, almost two percent increase. And now May, we have seen a slight jump uh, as well. Um, you know, we've gotten the question a lot from many board members uh, and, you know, what can we do to help out uh, these residents? And I think I said it earlier, we take the position that at the end of the day, you can't be waiving assessments, right? 
we're not Google making tons of profits mm -hmm. and whatnot. Um, but when it comes to late fees, um, interest, and 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 potential collections, uh, what's your take, uh, Kat, maybe on on what the association's approach should be? Um, well, the first thing is um, under the statute, if it's we've seen a situation where certain unit owners say, "Oh, can I forbear collection for a couple months? Um, I don't have the you know financial capability to pay that right now." And the the issue that unit owners need to understand is a, an association cannot forbear collection on one unit and not do it for the other, or they can't suspend assessments for one unit um, and not do it for the rest. So that obviously creates a large financial detriment to an association who the bulk of your budget is going to be collecting those monthly assessments. Um, in terms of you know collections, the more flexibility you have there is whether or not an association has the ability and is willing to you know, whether it's waive a late fee for a shortened amount of time or um, depending on what your governing documents say, do the same with interest. Um, Jonathan, is there anything else? Yeah, I mean, I would say that uh, first, I, I agree, uh, you know, of course I agree with Kat, you know, in terms of you can't waive assessments or excuse payment of assessments. Um, you can potentially, you have to look at your governing documents right. in every case, but you can potentially, you know, excuse late fees, but not, picking and choosing, doing it across the board. As far as interest goes, again, it's it's a problematic thing, generally, to have a global collections policy where you're gonna say, well, we'll forbear, people can pay late, and right. because that applies to everybody, and then it becomes a real financial burden. But if the associate, and, and again, I say this with all sympathy for what's going on, I understand the the, the, the reasoning that someone might use to think that that's appropriate and makes sense on some level. And I'm sympathetic to the people who need to pay that money and are having a hardship. By all means, I get that. And in a case by case basis, the association can talk with its council about some limited reasonable forbearance type of thing. Interest should not be just waived because it's a statutory requirement. I would say that if anything, what you do is you say, we're gonna treat the payment as not delinquent. Right. For this amount of time we're basically right. going to give a grace period Correct. for payment Correct. of this particular assessment to help everybody kind of like a lot of different you know creditors and contracting yeah. things are doing in just general society so maybe you say well the april assessment will give a 30-day grace period right. because of the, you know or the may now we're in may but you know the june assessment or this special assessment will defer payment one month that's potential you know not that, but I have to proceed with extreme caution because you have to look at every association situation differently. And so that's a conversation with council and management. And I'll give you some examples of how it could be case by case. You know, an association with a healthy balance sheet, you know, with significant cash operating funds, with healthy reserves, may have more flexibility than mm -hmm. an association that is not in that right. position. Associations right. can and should look at these things holistically, like. Do we have reserves? If we have a healthy reserve, maybe we can get a vote of the members at a remote meeting with proxies or online voting to approve the mis the use, the proper use of reserves to pay our operating shortfall anticipated because of the grace period and the coronavirus. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. In fact, it's a sensible thing to do, especially for components whose replacement, whose replacement is, is deferred for another 20 years, right? You can, you can curtail the audit requirement. If you're an association that needs to do an audit, you can vote to say this year, we're not gonna do an audit because it's expensive and we have coronavirus and the finances are all up and down. So we're gonna take a year off with that and we're gonna lower the requirement. You could look at getting a loan, right? Getting a loan to secure a, cap, a line of credit. Uh, but that typically comes with a special assessment so right. there's pros and cons of that and and an unhealthy balance sheet is not less not necessarily conducive to getting a loan this back to the emergency powers question under our interpretation of emergency powers in a given situation we might say we think they apply we think the better interpretations they apply so we think that there's an argument you can get a loan without a membership approval yeah Maybe, maybe. I'm not saying that's my advice. I'm saying we could say that hypothetically. Then, a, but there's a question of whether a lender would go with that. 
because probably the lender is going to say, even if I get an opinion from counsel that this is okay, I'm not going to do it without a vote of the members. Yeah. And so you got to, it takes two to tango. You got to have the lender buy in. And it's, it remains to be seen whether lenders will actually loan money without a vote of the members. I doubt it. But if you're a member, you're probably going to vote in favor of a loan because you're under financial hardship yourself and you want to spread that out and get a line of credit. Of so course. there's a lot of different options. to, to and, and, and when it comes to, to, let's say, the collection process in itself. So we, we know all those documentation, you know, if you give someone a, a um, some kind of forbearance in, in the late fees and whatnot or, or time to pay, that, that's official record of the association, right? Um, so you have to be very cautious when it comes to what you're doing and what you're agreeing to, because technically whatever you agree to, you're going to need to agree to with someone else if they're providing a similar similar documentation or request. With that being said, would what kind of what kind of lenience are you seeing, or maybe you're not seeing it yet, but do you believe is going to be somewhat considerable? I mean, I know the balance sheet is an important component. I would agree with you guys 100%. Should we stop the collection process in, in the sense of sending the notices at least and, and advising the residents of, of their responsibility? Uh, I'll, I'll just begin by putting context to this, which is like any council in this situation would remind the board of the crisis of 2008 and what happened with mortgages, right? Yeah, because, yep. because, when, because there's the mortgage issue. And if the mortgage takes title and begins a foreclosure, the association could be in a position where it can never collect that debt from the owner. Right. And that's a long-term financial major problem that can really hurt a condominium association or a homeowners association. And so the decisions being made today could impact that equation. Because if an association just says, well, we're gonna wait two months, we're not gonna do the normal collection process, we're going to just, we're gonna do a two months forbearance, we're gonna do that. We're not going to proceed with foreclosure. Um, the mortgagee will eventually be able to do that. And, sure. and depending on where things are, the association could be behind. And now the association's waiting on the mortgagee. Who knows how long that will take? Who knows what laws will stop the mortgagee, right? It's fluid. Then the mortgagee takes title. The association's limited to a safe harbor. Everybody must pay. So now a bad situation becomes exponentially worse. Similar, in, 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 and I'll segue to a related issue about amendments, which is some documents are really bad for associations in, in relation to this issue. Some governing documents have outdated provisions that are not consistent with the current statute. And so situations where the association can recover money, they will not recover money because of their old documents. And these are provisions that don't even necessarily hurt mortgagees and may not require their approval. They're uncontroversial. They probably affect some third party bidder, you know, for a year from now. But yeah. if associations don't stop right now and say, what do we have to amend? We should try. Then they're gonna get hit with a financial burden in a year that they could have avoided potentially if they could get the members. So with all these things, you have to have the perspective of the mortgagee part of the equation. And then Correct. of course, Kat can speak to some of the laws that affect this, right? So for example, um, you know, there's that, there, there's potential for new laws uh, that could be enacted that like right now, uh, Kat can speak to the moratorium on foreclosures and evictions, right? right. There's presently like a moratorium. And then mm -hmm. of course, there's potential legislation in Congress that Kat can speak to. Correct. So right now, um, there is a moratorium on evictions and foreclosures. It went into effect, um, I believe it was in April. Um, it recently got extended through June 1st. And so what we're seeing is there was a standstill on all of these. Um, and it, you, couldn't file, you couldn't file an eviction proceeding. You couldn't file a mortgage foreclosure proceeding. And then if there was one that was pending, it kind of put a standstill on that where judges were canceling it. And we also saw, um, there was a question with the initial order that was entered as to whether or not that would apply to a lien foreclosure because the language of the order said, you know, it had to be a Fannie Mae loan. It had to be a mortgage foreclosure. Um, but then judges, a lot of judges took that interpretation to mean, well, no, we're going to start canceling all lien foreclosures. So they put that into the umbrella. And so that caused a lot of the pending associations um, lien foreclosures at a halt, um, we saw a lot of those cancellations. And so 
We'll see now in the next month or so whether or not they're going to extend that, which I think is pretty likely, or whether they'll uh, begin resuming those and then um, you know, all mortgage foreclosures and lien foreclosures will proceed um, in whether or not they can go to a sale. Um, right now there is the HEROES Act, which is pending and before the Senate, um, and that's potentially very detrimental because that will not allow, um, you know, and everyone else can touch base on this, but that won't allow associations to collect. Um, and the way it's done there, it's really um, the debt collector. So it's not necessarily that associations need to stop um, collecting their monthly assessments. It's more so the process of when a unit goes into delinquency and a law firm gets involved and then the law firm is deemed the debt collector. Um, where you're you're sending out your notices of intent to file the claim of lien and going through that process, um, it'll put a it'll put a halt on that. Yeah, so yeah. I I know when when I saw that Heroes Act, you know, in a way I freaked out because <laughs> I mean I can't.